thought he was going to preach part of my sermon. I thought we were going to have that preach. Colossians chapter 3. Yeah, you know, if the meetings are good, you know, I know Brother Robert saying we're trying to do more meetings this year. They, they're they good. You know, I just got back from Houston that can't meet down there. And somebody asked me, why do you go down there twice a year? I go down there and get my battery charged. Good to be around other people of God and see other young men my age and other men of God that are trying to serve God. And so meetings are to encourage you and to get you lifted up. And that's why Brother Robert's trying to do it, to get us to where we'll get encouraged, to where we might get a little fire lit down in us. If there's one thing we need today, is we need some fire. And in Colossians chapter 3, it begins in verse 1, it says, If you didn't be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Dear Lord, we come to your prayer. Dear God, we thank you for just another chance that we can preach your word. Dear God, we thank you, dear God, for a church that does give to missions. Dear God, and people that are willing to give. We're blessed with that. Dear God, we're blessed with a, a group of people that aren't afraid to give. And we appreciate that. Dear God, we just pray that you would help our church to go forth and to come here and to, just to try to be a light for you, dear God, that we might see a soul or two saved in the coming year. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you study the book of Colossians, You'll find in chapter 2, Paul talks about the sufficiency of Christ and how that Christ is enough. And as a believer, Christ is all we need. You know, we get so bound down with the things of the world and often we forget that really Christ is all we need. The moment that yeah. I got born again, He became all that I need. I don't need anything else. Hey, my, I may not have the fanciest car, I may not have the fanciest home, but as long as I got Christ, Paul is saying over there in chapter 2, hey, as long as you've got Christ, you've got all you need. Yeah. You don't need to worry about anything else. And then in chapter 3, he talks about the true center of the Christian life. How that Christ should be the true center of our life. And, and Paul knew more than anybody that he wanted to get his affection set on things above. Paul knew more than anybody, after all the beatings he had went through, after all the times he had been locked up in jail, after everything that God had put Paul through, Paul had got to a point in his life where Paul said, hey, my affections are set on things above. Paul was saying that, hey, the things of this world don't matter to me. Yeah. The things of this world are not important to me. Paul had got to a point in his life where Paul's eyes were fixed upon heaven. Where all that mattered to Paul was getting to heaven. Yeah. All that mattered to Paul is what he could do for Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, hey, for me to die is gain. Paul said, hey, for me to die and get out of here, I'm far better. Yeah. Paul knew. Paul had got his mind focused. That word affection also means mind. Paul was saying, get your mind focused on heaven. Yeah. Get a glimpse of heaven and get focused on heaven. And when you do that, you find that the things of the world become meaningless to you. You find that that job don't mean much to you. You find that that home you got really don't mean that much to you because you're totally focused on the things of heaven and getting to heaven and how you can sow and get rewards laid up in heaven. And that's what Paul's talking about. So just for a few minutes tonight, looking unto heaven. Yeah. Where are you looking tonight? Yeah. What is your mind set on tonight? Is it the things of the world? Is it the things of the world that's got your attention tonight? Paul says, hey, set your affections on things above. Begin to get your mind set on things above and then the things of the world become dim. The things of the world don't matter anymore. You know, like down there where I live, I might live in a little 16 by 80, three bedroom mobile home, but thank God it's paid for and it's all that I need. I don't need a big fancy home. Why? Because He's promised me a mansion over there. I've got a mansion waiting for me. One of these days, I'm going to move out of that little mobile home and I'm going to move into a mansion that He's going to prepare for me. So I'm like Paul. I want to get my mind focused on heaven because if I get my mind focused on heaven, then the things of the world and the things around me, they won't matter to me much anymore. Yeah. Whether I got money or whether I got fame or fortune, those things become meaningless after a little while. And so first of all, we need to look under heaven because that's where our citizenship is. Mm -hmm. What it says in the book of Hebrews about Abraham, he sought for a city. 
He yeah. was looking for a city, a city, not on this place. He was yeah. looking for a heavenly city. Yeah. Abraham was looking for some place far better than this. And that's why all through the New Testament it says we're pilgrims. Yeah. We're just passing through. Yeah. That this down here is not our home. And my, how we get so comfortable in this world and what we don't realize is this world ain't our home. Just like Brother Robert was saying, it's all going to burn up one day. The home you own, the car you own, all the money you got in the bank, one day it's all gone. Yeah. It's going to all disappear one day. And guess what? It ain't going to be much use anymore. Yeah. All that matters in the Christian life is setting our mind toward heaven. Getting our focus toward heaven. And that's why Paul says there, hey, Set your affections on things above. Begin to look on things above. Take your eyes off the things of the world and get to a point in your life where you're setting your affections on things above. And you know, you find when you get around a Christian, it really gets to that point in life. They're always singing a song. They're always happy. You just get around them and you can feel God all over them. Why? Because they found somewhere along that Christian life that, hey, if I'll just get my mind focused on heaven. Yeah. You know, Brother Farley was talking about down there at the meeting this year about Brother Leroy Dalrymple. Well, some of y'all know who he is. One of the craziest preachers you'll meet just like Brother Lutry. But like Brother Farley said, he said, I always want him in my camp meeting. He says, because you watch when it comes time for the altar, all them young men are running straight for Leroy Dalrymple. Mm -hmm. And they're asking Brother Leroy Dalrymple, pray with me that I might have the power of God that you have. That I might get filled with the Spirit of God so that I can do something. And they're trying to get their mind focused on heaven. And that's one thing that's killing us today. And we're so focused on the world. The world ain't got much to offer you and I. You can build up all the treasure you want. You can pay a thousand dollar a month house note to have a big mansion. You're going to lose it one day. Yeah. One day all this we see around us is going to be completely wiped out. Yes, sir. And that's why Paul gets over in the book of Colossians and Paul says, Hey, look toward heaven. Yeah. If you're a born again child of God, that's where your citizenship is tonight. It says in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, Notwithstanding in, the, in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yeah. The moment I got saved, the moment I accepted Christ as my Savior, my name was written down in heaven. Yeah. Down here on this side of eternity, my name may never be put in light. Yeah. Yeah. I may never be famous. They may never know me across this country. I may never be a famous preacher, but I can tell you this tonight, in heaven, they know my name. And yeah. thank God to that. I don't need the world's fame and fortune. Why? Because I got it over there. Yeah. That My name's written there. Abraham knows who I am. Paul knows who I am. God knows who I am. And my name is written in life on that side. Yeah. If you're a born again child of God, you may never be famous on this side. But if your citizenship's in heaven, your name's written up there. They know who you are. Yeah. Down here you may never be known, but at least on that side of eternity, they know who you are. And second of all, Looking unto heaven because our rewards are in heaven. You know, if you go to my, mom, my mom's house, my mom's still so proud of them. But if you go to my mom's house and go in the back bedroom, you'll find some trophies. And if you'll get them trophies down and you'll take enough time to wipe the dust off of them, you'll find that they got my name on them. Where when I went to the Christian school in Houston, I won some trophies for memorizing the Ten Commandments. I won some trophies for being able to quote certain scripture. But those things to me tonight are meaningless. I won those trophies 27 years ago. And if you go to my mom's house now and you look at them, they're all covered in dust and they're all falling apart. They don't mean anything. Yeah. Tonight, 27 years later, them trophies don't amount to a hill of beans to me. Yeah. I could care less about them trophies. That's why I don't have them in my house. Why? Because they're meaningless. Because I've learned that my trophies need to be over there. Yeah. I've learned that if I'll set up treasures over there, that's where the reward will come. Yeah. That's where I can get my reward. That's where I can get recognition at. And that's why it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, Brother Robert talked about it all ago. They not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust dust corrupt, and where three break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust dust corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. That's another question tonight. Where's your heart? What is your heart set upon tonight? Just like I said, them trophies tonight, they don't mean anything to me. 
Who cares how many trophies I won? Because those trophies, just like they're falling apart, one day them trophies will be gone. One day them trophies are going to get thrown in the trash. And they're meaningless. Yeah, they were good when I was in school, and yeah, I was happy when I won them. Sure. But I've learned 27 years later that them trophies really don't amount to a hill of beans. That all the trophies I can win down here, that all the fame I can have down here, really don't matter much. People ask me all the time, why don't you let your kids play sports? And I'm not preaching against you. If you let your kids play sports, that's fine. That's between you and God. But I tell people all the time, because I can care less whether my son becomes a famous football player. Yeah. I can care less whether he becomes a famous basketball player. Yeah. I would much rather him realize that, hey, my treasures need to be laid up in heaven. Sure. I need to get my mind focused on heaven so that one day when I step <laughs> over in the glory, there my rewards will be. Amen. And you go over there, me and Brother Bob was talking about it earlier. I truly believe this. The Bible talks about crowns that you and I can win. And there's one crown, of, a crown of faithfulness you can win. I think about Brother uh, Lester Hobbs over there. Yeah. You talk to anybody about Lester Hobbs and the next word that always follows, faithful. Yeah. Just been faithful down through the years. And as I was preparing this message, I began to think about Brother Richmond and how that they tell me that he's been a lifelong member and he's been here through every single preacher that's come through the door. Yeah. And every time you walk in the door, and Brother Richmond may not realize this, but I, get, I guarantee you Brother Robert would back me up. Every time you walk through the door and he's sitting where he ought to be and he's in his place, it encourages you to yeah. just keep going on. Sure. And Brother Richmond will step over into glory one day and God will look at him and say, Here, Brother Richmond, here's your crown of faithfulness. Amen. For being faithful to the house of God. For sticking it out through every single pastor that walked through the door and you just stayed sitting right where you belong and you just kept coming and you stayed faithful. Yeah. A lot of our members can look at Brother Richmond and learn how to be faithful. Yeah. He's always here. Unless he's out of town or unless he's really sick, you can always find Brother Richmond sitting in the same pew in the same spot and he's always there. And I've always believed this. A lot of people may not agree with me. But the Bible says when we get over in the glory, He's going to give us those crowns. And the Bible says we're just going to turn around and take all our crowns and throw them at the feet of Him. And then you get over in the book of Revelation and it talks about how He's going to come back on a white horse with a crown upon His head. I truly believe He's going to take every one of our crowns. He's going to make one big old crown. He's going to plop it down on His head. He's going to ride back down to this earth. He's going to stomp out the wine press. He's going to get the victory. The Bible says the blood's going to run as high as the bridle of the horse and they're going to declare that he's king. And I've always said this, you may not bow this out of eternity, but there's coming a day you're going to bow. Yeah. You're going to bow to my king. There's coming a day where you will bow to my king yeah. and my savior and the one that bled and died for me. But I believe he's going to take all them crowns and he's going to melt all of them down and fashion one crown and he's going to set it on his head. We'll ride behind Him and be able to see the crowns that we won for our Savior. You say, why do we serve down here? It's for our Savior and for us. You say, why did Paul say, get your mind set on heaven? Because Paul was saying, hey, it ain't about you. It's all about Him. Yeah. The moment you get saved, it should come less about you and more about yeah. Him. It ought to, your life ought to be centered around Him and bringing Him honor and bringing Him glory. That's what the Christian life is supposed to be about. To bring our Savior honor yeah. and glory that He is due. Yeah. Just like those missionary boys that sold out their life and went over to that, 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 that plot of land to go to those slaves. And as they stood on that ship, the one boy said, May the Lamb receive the rewards of His suffering. They sold their life into slavery so that they might win some other slaves. They left everything they had behind and sold their self into slavery and said, may the lamb receive the reward. Yes. The missionary boys had figured out that, hey, it ain't about me, but it's about him. And if I sell myself into slavery, and if I go over here and win just a few slaves, it'll bring him honor. Sure. It'll bring him glory. We need to look unto heaven tonight because that's where our rewards are. Yeah. This earth don't mean much to you and I. I don't know about you, but I hope one day I can stand with Brother Robert and I hope we get to stand side by side. And I hope we stand there side by side and God just turns around and looks and says, Hey, Brother Robert, Brother Joey, well done. You stuck it out. Yeah. Even when the congregation was low and you didn't have much to preach to, you just kept going. Yeah. Even when no one got on the bus, you just kept going. Yeah. Even when it seemed like no one else in the church cared and their affections were set on the world and you got your affections set on mine, you just remained faithful. Yeah. 
That's my hope tonight. I hope that when I get into glory, I can stand beside my pastor and hear God look at both of us and say, Hey, boys, well done. Man. Yeah. You laid up your treasures in heaven. That's why I love to look back there at that board back there and see all the missionaries on it. You realize every time you give to missions that every soul that missionary wins to Christ, yep. you get part of that reward. Exactly right. You get part of it. They was telling over there, this, the, this week was the first time my dad had been to Shady Acres in 30 years. It was such a blessing to be in that camp meeting with my dad. But Brother Farley got him to come up and stand up on the stage and just give a little testimony about what had been done. But Brother Farley told a story before Daddy went up there. And he said, way back 30 years ago, when Daddy became a member of Shady Acres, he was working in an auto parts store, and he was making $150 a week. He tithed on that $150 a week, and then above that, he was given $75 a week commission. And he just give and give. And the treasury of Shady Acres, who was working a job making 10 times more than my dad was, he got so mad that my dad was giving as much commission as he was, he got out of church and quit church and wouldn't come no more. He told Brother Jack Woods, he said, I can't understand how a poor man can give as much to missions as me. He said, how is he? The Bible says you ought to take care of your family. I'm living proof tonight, 37 years later, we never did without. Sure. We never went without hunger. They, they tell stories all the time how that one time the hot water heater went out and Daddy looked at Mom and said, guess what? I'm not buying a hot water heater. We'll just take cold bath because I'm not going to take away from my mission. I'm just going to keep giving to my mission. And finally somebody in the church went and bought him a hot water heater. He said, I am not going to quit giving to missions. I'm going to give to missions. And I began to think as Brother Farley was telling that story by my mind. All these years of just giving to missions. Giving to missions. Giving to missions. I can only imagine when he steps over into glory. Yeah. And God looks at him and says, Hey, Brother Billy Joe, turn around and look. Every soul you see standing behind you yeah. is a result yeah. of every missionary you put on the feet. It may, may, it may not make sense whenever Brother Robert gets up here and says, all right, we're going to take on another missionary. We're going to give more to missionary. Last year, Brother Farley was talk, telling that Shady Acres gave six hundred and something thousand dollars This year, they pledged over $700,000 to missions. Yeah. Why? Because that church down there has figured out that, hey, if we get heavenly minded, and if we give everything we got to missions, we ain't going to get no rewards down here. We may not have much money down here, but man, when we step over into glory, we're going to see a flood of people that them missionaries won the cross. Where's your treasure at tonight? The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart. Is your mind and your heart set on things above? Are you looking into heaven tonight? Have you got focused unto heaven? I can only imagine what God has in store for us for all the missionaries we support. We'll never see it down here. Every one of them missionaries back there that are out there winning souls, you'll never know. But if you give to missions tonight, I can promise you this. When you step over into glory, you might just be surprised at the hundreds of souls. And God looks at you and says, yeah. they're here because you was willing to sacrifice. Yeah. That's a word that as Christians today, we're so scared of. Sacrifice. Yeah. That's what my dad was doing them 37 years ago. He was sacrificing because daddy had found out that, hey, if I'll give to missions and if I'll pay my tithes and if I'll give above and beyond, I'm not going to see it down here, but I'm going to see it over there. And thank God today, as old as he is, God's allowed him to see a little bit of his reward. God's blessed him more now than he's ever been blessed. Got a home paid for, cars paid for, got money in the bank. But you know what? He'll tell you tonight, he's still giving the mission. He still increases his missions every year. Every year he makes sure that his missions get raised $20 more. I can only fathom what that man gives to missions tonight. But he's still just plugging in. He's still just giving in. All these years, I can tell you, I'm healthy tonight. We never suffered one time. We always had clothes. We always had food. There was always a roof above us. And I've learned one thing from watching him. Down here, it don't matter much. Yeah. These rewards down here that we get don't matter much. I could let my son play basketball and he could win every award in the world. But guess what? They don't matter. Mm -hmm. He can become an MB player, become an MVP. It ain't going to matter. I'd rather step my foot over in the glory and, say, and have God say, Hey, what? guess what, buddy? You're MVP. 
You gave more. You did more. You sold more. You got your mind set on things above. And you said, I'm going with you. You know, if you ever study out about the Spirit of God, when you and I get saved, the Spirit of God comes to live inside. But where most Christians stop, they stop there. They don't study the rest of that out. The Bible says that you're also to be filled with the Spirit of God. You're also to walk in the Spirit of God. You're also to be led by the Spirit of God. It's more than just getting the Holy Spirit. God says, not only am I going to give you the Holy Spirit, but guess what? If you want to be filled, it's going to take effort. If you want to walk in the Spirit, it's going to take effort. If you want to have the Holy Spirit lead you, it's going to take effort. And we need to get our mind focused on heaven because that's where our treasures is. And lastly, it's where our Savior is. It's where the one that bled and died for you and I is. The Bible says that when we see Him, we shall be as He is. You say, Brother Joy, why do you want to be heavenly minded? Because that's where my daddy is. That's where the one that loved me. As much as I enjoyed spending them three days in Houston with my dad, and as much as I love my dad, I love my Savior much more. Because my Savior did for me what my daddy never could do. Yeah. He laid his life down on Calvary, and he gave me life with you, and he freed me from the bondage of sin. Amen. And that's where our Heavenly Father is. That's why the Bible says in, in Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession. He's our advocate. If you ever study that word advocate out, one of the meanings is one who pleads the cause of another. Yeah. You say, why do you want to get heavenly minded? Because that's where the one is that pled my cause. Mm -hmm. That's where the one is that turned to God the Father and said, hey, this boy's a sinner and he's lost and he's on his way to hell, but he's asked to get saved and I'm going to step in for him. That's why I love that song Brother Kerry sings with mercy stepped in. Yeah. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm glad one day mercy stepped into my life. I'm glad one day as a nine-year-old boy, I found that I was lost and on my way to hell, and mercy stepped into my life. And I'm glad that not long after, not about five years ago, after 13 years of backsliding and running from God, I'm glad that once again, mercy stepped into my life, and God said, boy, pick up, dust yourself off, and I'm going to give you another chance, yeah. and I'm going to use you, and I'll let you bring me honor and glory. I thank God for mercy. He's our advocate. Not only that, he's preparing a place. I've always been a firm believer for this. I ain't got no scripture to wrap it up, so this is going to be Joy Whitener version. There you go. I believe the Bible says he's going to prepare a place for me. I've got a mansion there. You're a born again child of God tonight, you've got a mansion there. I believe he's going to customize it to fit us. I just truly believe that. I believe when I walk through the door of my mansion, it's going to be just like I imagined it. He's just going to customize it to fit me. I believe when you walk through the door of your mansion, it's just going to be customized to fit you. And got no scripture to back it up, just what I believe. Sure. But that's where our Heavenly Father is. Mm -hmm. You need to get heavenly minded tonight because that's where the one that died for you. That's where the one that fights for you. That's where the one that makes intercession for you tonight. And not only that, not only is he preparing a place, but he's a friend that sticks close to the brother. Sticks closer than a brother. There's one thing. I found out over the past couple of years. A lot of the young men my age today, they're wanting to sell out. They're wanting to get into the contemporary music. They're wanting to get into the easy believism. And I find that the more you stick with the old stuff, and I said this the other day and I made some people mad, these men of God that came before us, the old men of God that came before us and told us how we are to dress and how we are to live and how we are to act and they, and they preached to us standards and convictions and morals and they set the standard up here and the young men of God in my age and my generation we come and we took an act and we chopped down that standard and we threw it in the dust and we said that what they had, that old time religion don't work anymore, that we're going to do it our way, we're going to reach the generation and we're going to do it our way, well I'm still a firm believer that old time religion Work. It was old time religion that freed my dad from the bondage of alcohol and I still believe that old time religion works today. And I still believe that the men of God that came before me and raised the standard up, I believe what we need to do as men of God today and Christians today, we need to take the standard and raise it higher than they did. We ought to have a more desire than they had to live for God. As much as Brother Robert has lived for God, I ought to have a desire as a young man to look at him and look up to him and say, hey, I need to raise the standard high. 
I need to look to Him on how I ought to dress. I need to look to Him on how I need to live. My wife needs to look to his wife and see how she ought to dress and how she ought to live. You know, there was a day and a time, and I know you ain't going to like it, there was a day and a time when we as church members came into the church and the pastor and his wife was our example. The young men wanted to dress like the pastor. Yeah. The young women wanted to dress like the pastor's wife. Yeah. They looked to the pastor and his wife and that was the standard of living. Today we look at the pastor and his wife and we laugh at her. Sure. But look at the pastor's wife. Everywhere she goes, she's got a dress up. Well, I just can't believe you. Now what you ought to say is maybe she's a godly woman and maybe she's trying to support her husband and live a godly life and maybe she's trying to get close to God. Maybe she's got her mind set on heaven and all that really matters to her is what her heavenly father thinks and all that really matters to her is where she's laying up her rewards and so she's wearing a dress but she just believes she ought to follow her husband and she just believes that that's the way God said it ought to be. Yeah. There was a time where we believed that as young men of God. There was a time as young men of God and young women of God, we looked to the older men of God and we said, that's the way we need to live our life. You know, people ask me all the time, why do you wear a suit all the time, Brother George? Because them old men of God told me when I surrendered to preach, they said, Brother Joy, when you get into the Old Testament, the priest was identified by the garment that he wore. He said, so if you're going to surrender to preach and be a preacher, you ought to be identified by the garment you wear. I like what Brother Farley said in the camp meeting this year. He said, whether we realize it or not as Christians, the world has a higher standard of us than we do. When you say Christian to the world, they automatically think that you should look a certain way, that you should be dressed a certain way, that you should talk a certain way, that there's places you ought not go. Whether you realize it tonight or not, the world's got a higher standard of you than you do. When they think of Christian, they automatically think of someone that is set apart. You say, why do we come to church? Because these are walls of separation. Yeah. Why in the Bible does God say build walls? In Nehemiah, when Nehemiah went down to build the walls, he was building walls of separation. That's why the, one of the best messages you ever preach out of Nehemiah is build you a wall of separation. Because if you ever build a wall of separation and you keep it standing, the world will stay out here and God will stay in here. Whether you believe that or not, if you'll, if you'll take and build you a wall of separation and say that, look, me and my family is going to stand back here. And the, we're going to keep the world out here. And we're going to keep God in here. And you build that wall high enough, then the next thing you know, God starts blessing you. Yeah. God starts working through you. You, start, you begin to get filled with the Holy Spirit of God. God can begin to use you. We wonder why as young men tonight, God ain't using us. It's because we ain't got a very high wall of separation. We've allowed so much of the world into our life that our wall of separation is about this high tonight. Yeah. So we need to get heavenly minded because of where our Father is and He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. One of my favorite songs is that song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. But if you'll go do a study on that, every one of the hymnals we sang, they've got a story behind it. Yeah. But the guy that wrote that song was an evangelist named Dr. Charles Wiggle. And Dr. Dr. Charles Wiggle after, came home one night after preaching a camp meeting, and when he walked in, there was a note on the table, and his wife told him, I'm gone. I no longer want to live the life of an evangelist. She said, I'm leaving you, and I'm gone. And Dr. Wiggle said, after much despair, after much uh, warning, he said, I even contemplated suicide several times. He said, I just didn't know what to do. He said, one night, sitting at the piano, he said, it just came to me. And he wrote these words down while sitting at that piano. And I can't sing, so I'm just going to read it. He said, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in Him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how He changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as He. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much He cared for me. He realized that even though his wife was gone, and even though he would have to go on by himself, that he had a friend that was going to stick closer than a brother. Dr. Wiggle had realized that, hey, even though it seems like gloom, and even though she's gone, and even though I must still go on and preach, he realized that, hey, I've still got a friend. I've still got one that's walking beside me. You say, why should we get heavenly minded tonight? Because you and I have got a friend. Yeah. 
that when your friends won't be there, he'll be there. When you get to the most toughest and lowest times of your life, and you look around and there's no one else there, he'll be there. Mm -hmm. I'm glad tonight that i got a friend that even if I was to lose my wife and children, even if I was to lose every preacher friend I had, I know he'd still be right there beside me. I know that as long as I desire him, and as long as I'll get heavenly minded, he's promised me, Joy, I'll never leave you. Mm -hmm. I'll never forsake you. Even though you for, you're forsaken, even though sometimes you're down and out, he says, Joy, I'm just going to stick beside you. You see, what was Paul telling us in Colossians chapter 3? Paul was saying, hey, get your affection. Get your mind set on things above. And you'll find that the more you do, the more this world will become dim. Yeah. And the more you'll get up every day and you'll have a song in your heart, the more you'll get up every day and want to pray and read your Bible because you realize that, hey, He's really all that matters. Yeah. I can tell you this tonight. I'm only 37 years old. I know I'm just a young whippersnapper and I'm wet behind the ears. But I can tell you this I've learned in the past year that He's all that matters. Whether these other young preachers want to stand with the old stuff and go with the old stuff, I'll just stick with the old man. Yeah. They can laugh at me. They can ridicule. They can tell me what they want. Just the best advice I got was the other day from Brother Farley. Brother Farley said, Brother Joy, whatever you do, stay away from the young men of God of today. He said, because they're tired to tear down everything that the old men of God stood for. Mm -hmm. And if you're not careful, you'll fall right in behind. He says, Brother Farley told me this, he said, if there's one thing I learned and made me the man of God that I am today is I had to separate myself. And I had to say that no matter what, I was going to go with God. Yeah. What we need to do as young Christians again, and what we need to do as church members tonight, we need to get back to looking to our pastor and his wife. At one time, that was the standard to live by. I don't care what you say. You can talk to my dad that was going back there all them years ago and he'll tell you that he learned how to live by watching the exact world. And everyone in that church, you can talk to Dan Meadows, Brother Lutrick, all those men of God that came up to him, they'll say, we learned how to live by Brother Jack. Yeah. Years ago when people came to church, the wife and the pastor was the standard to live by. You say, Brother Joy, why do you make your wife wear a dress all the time? Because I just watched them old men of God down through the years. And I watched how they had the power of God. I watched how God blessed them. I watched, just like I said about Brother Alan Jones, his wife wrote a book on the pastor's wife. I believe it was her that wrote it. Every woman ought to get that book and go through it and read it. But you can watch down there at Shady Acres. When conviction sets in down there, and them young girls begin to flood to that altar, they're headed for one woman. And that's Miss Jones. They want Miss Jones to pray for them. You say, why? Because they've watched her down through the years and they've seen that, hey, Miss Jones has the power of God. If anyone's going to get a prayer through, Miss Jones is going to get a prayer through. And I know as a young preacher in the day and time we live in, it ain't too popular for my wife to wear a dress everywhere she goes. But you know what I've learned to say? I don't care what you think. We want God. And all that matters to us is God. We've learned to get our minds set on heaven because we've learned as a young couple that, hey, the race is just about over. We're almost fixing to step through the pearly gates. This thing is just about to the end. Only about now. I may not have learned to serve God, but I want to look to my pastor and other old men of God that stood down through the years and say, whatever they got and the standard they set, that's what I'm going to live by. And if he tells me I need to do this or do that, instead of questioning him, I'm just going to say, all right, pastor, whatever you think, let's go. That's another problem we're facing in our churches today. The pastor, that's why I know it ain't a very hot topic around here, but that's why I'm glad I'm part of a church where the pastor runs the church. And where we can just get behind the pastor and say, all right, pastor, whatever. Because a wise man of God put this in my ear about two years ago. He said, always remember this, Joey. He said, you get under the man, of God, the man of God and you submit your life to Him. And wherever He says go, even if you do not agree with it, and even if you're totally dead set against it, you just go with Him 
Because he's the one that's the shepherd, and he's the one that will answer to God. Yeah. And your job is simply to submit and follow. You say, what is our job as West Baptist Church? Is to submit to the pastor. And to submit to the pastor's wife. And wherever they say go, our job is to say, all right, let's go. If this church will ever amount to anything, it's going to take you and I submitting to our pastor and his wife and saying, wherever you lead, if you think we ought to take all the money out of the treasure and give it to missions, give it to missions. And we're to stand behind them support. As the piano player comes tonight, what is your mindset on tonight? Paul said, set your mind on things above. That's why the Bible said where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where's your heart tonight? Where's your mind tonight? If you'll stand as she begins to play tonight, what's got your attention tonight? I don't know about you, but like I said before, the Richmond may not realize it, but it's a blessing in my heart every time I come to church. And you can always count on Brother Richmond to be sitting in that view. He may not say amen loud enough for us to hear it. He may not run the aisles like I have before and, and shout. But I can tell you this, he's faithful. I can tell you this tonight, as church members, we could learn from Brother Richmond how to be faithful.